Welcome to today's webinar, Great Agreement Communities, Addressing Affordable Housing and Sustainability, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides current information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides news and information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics, available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter for smart growth and planning news and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed by the speaker in this webinar are those of the speaker and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the state of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Greater Green Communities Addressing Affordable Housing and Sustainability. You can also search for event number 92173770. I would also like to acknowledge our partner today, Island Press, and their partnerships manager, Jen Hawes. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and to create solutions to its complex problems. So to get started, our speaker today is Dana Borland. Dana Borland is Vice President for the Environment at the JPD Foundation. Before taking this position, Dana was Vice President of Green Initiatives for the Enterprise Community Partners, a nonprofit dedicated to making well-designed homes affordable. Dana developed and oversaw all aspects of Enterprise's Green Communities Program, including the creation of the Green Communities Criteria and Enterprise's Multifamily Retrofit Program. Following her presentation, Dana, Dana will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dana to get started. Welcome, Dana. Terrific. Thanks, Michael. Let me get uh, situated here so that I can share my screen. Um, and let me know when you can see my presentation. Can you see it? Uh, it's not yet. Did you okay. select the um, Let's see. Um, I'm yeah, not go sure to, how you practice this, sorry. <laughs> yeah, go to sharing. Go to sharing, okay. And then try and expand that and then see where it says show all the way to the left. Um, yes, that's the one I have. Show screen. So uh, click the screen drop down so that okay. you can you can select the mon the other monitor. Okay. How's that? Let's see. It's coming. There you go. Great. Okay. Terrific. Um, sorry about that, everybody. We we definitely practiced, and 
it's probably just because I'm super excited to be here today. So my name's Dana. I use she, her pronouns to describe myself. And I'm zooming in from occupied Lenape and Wappinger land. And as I write about it in my book, the first step of this gray to green transition is recognizing land sovereignty and the right of the community to have effective access to control over and use of their land. So if you would please acknowledge, uh, maybe by writing it down on a piece of paper or saying it out loud to yourself, the land on which you are standing today. And if you're not quite sure, uh, I urge you to quickly go after the webinar to native hyphen land dot ca you can type in your zip code and learn a lot about the land on which you stand um, and speaking of history i want to recognize how great it is to be reconnected with john coleman and michael bear and the whole team at mdp i hear bihoy is might be participating i worked there for several years and it was just a wonderful place to work phenomenal people great sense of community and uh, you know I just have fond memories of cramming for the AICP exam after hours with Stephanie and Steve and of course Rich Hall as our mentor. I will always associate one acre of land with MDP and the AICP exam which one acre I will always know is 43,560 square feet. <laughs> so it's great to come full circle to be with you all today and uh, to have this webinar contribute to your AICP continuing education credits if you so choose. So my plan today is to spend about 10 minutes just providing an overview of the book that I wrote about uh, and then to walk through some of the main points just to make sure that we're all walking away from the webinar with kind of a shared understanding and resources that you could find in the handout which I believe will be made available to you after this webinar if you don't already have access to it. And then after that, we will open it up to a public forum for questions and comments and discussion. So hopefully you're seeing a slide that uh, does provide you a discount on the book, thanks to Island Press. So if you use the word smart, when you go to the Island Press website, it will save you 30% on the book. So thanks Island Press. Um, so we're going to start with a poll. Just uh, I told you a little bit about myself. So uh, if you could launch the first poll, John, that would be great. Excellent. So it is on the screen for everybody. Where do you mostly work? You have five uh, options to respond to it. And if you're having any issues with getting it, the uh, screen to respond, you may need to exit from full screen mode. And we'll leave it open for a few seconds here to give people a chance to respond. We do have a number of these polls um, today that during Dana's presentation. So uh, once you kind of master how that works, uh, be ready for more of these. And I can see the responses coming in. Thanks everybody for participating today. This is actually our largest registration to date. So thank you all for being here and thanks to Dana. Okay, so the response is here, 47% Northern US, 25% Southern US, 19% Western, 9% uh, national and international, and zero in tribal lands. Great, well, it's terrific to have such broad representation and we'll have to do better about connecting with people who are on tribal lands, but uh, let's move to the second poll. As Michael said, we we have three of these right off the bat just to kind of get warmed up. Okay, and then hopefully everybody sees the poll on your screen and you have the option of responding to the question from where are you working today? A lot of us are in virtual environments, home office, back in the office, my COVID getaway, which I had one of those, and we're not quite sure anymore, and that's also true. So I might choose multiple of these if I were responding to it. Again, <laughs> if um, you are having trouble, uh, you may need to exit, although it looks like a lot of folks are responding, so that's good. We'll leave it open uh, maybe another 10 seconds or so. And pop it in. So Great. People will soon know that I'm working from Manhattan here in New York City. You may hear some fire trucks or police cars, so I apologize in advance. 
Okay, so 71% today are in their home office, 26% in their in the office, 2% uh, not quite sure, and 1% in their COVID getaways. <laughs> Great, all right, and now we will go to the third and final poll for now. Okay, and you all will see this. What position are you, and that makes you interested in this topic? Uh, planner, public sector or private, developer or real estate professional, health professional, housing professional or advocate, and or, and finally, climate advocate and or scientist. So again, thanks for participating in these polls. It's always interesting to see who shows up. We do get some variants, although as uh, planners, we mostly get planners here, but not, not entirely. So the mix is always interesting to see. We give everybody another 10 seconds or so to respond. A lot of people are doing so. Okay, then a little higher than usual, but not much. A planner, 70%. 13% uh, are climate advocate and scientist. 11% are in the housing realm. 4% in development and real estate. And finally, 2% in health. Terrific. Well, that's super helpful. Um, and I think that will come into play when we get to the questions. I'm excited to hear what people are more interested in and questions and comments that you want to make. So terrific. I'm going to start then with the overview and then um, dive into some of the specifics. So really, the point I want to make is, is this book, uh, Greater Green Communities, is really about making quantum leaps in equitably addressing the dual crises of climate change and housing affordability in one fell swoop from going gray to green. And, you know, most of us, I think probably all of us uh, know this, but it is worth repeating that we're at an extraordinary point in human history. The people who had the least to do with creating the housing and climate crises are facing the impacts of both on a daily basis. And it's quite traumatic as I speak with people because you just don't know, you know, from day to day when that rug is going to get completely pulled out again from under your feet. And the problem, the way I see it, is that we're producing and preserving housing in this country that's just not meeting demand. And it's also very much at odds with our collective need to take action to curb carbon emissions. I was staggered to, to find out really that 20% of the carbon emissions in the United States stem from heating, cooling, and powering our homes. This makes our homes the world's sixth largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions, comparable to Brazil and more than Germany. So just think about that for a minute. At the center almost of our climate crisis is our housing. And as much as we would love a silver bullet or you know, one major action that we could take, um, and, and you know, we are making considerable strides in electrifying the decarbonizing the electric grid, but even that would be insufficient to reducing carbon emissions to a level that would avoid even more severe impacts than what we are experiencing now. Because half of all the housing in this country is at least 40 years old, if not older. And so it will continue inefficiently using fossil fuels if we don't intervene. And not only does this have a price in terms of the cost of disasters, but it traps people in obsolete homes paying higher utility bills. And when I say people, let me be very clear that these are people who are already paying more than 50% of their income for their rent or mortgage. It probably involves some of you on the call today who find yourself in that same situation. And these people are already having to choose between food or fuel, mortgage or medicine, let alone fun with the family, or a COVID getaway, um, or education. And because of our racialized land use policies and the history in this country of racist housing practices, we know that these are majority black, indigenous, and persons of color. And on any given night, over half a million people are without a home altogether, weathering storms, pandemics, 
and their work schedules from makeshift dwellings, not because these are bad people, it's because our systems have failed. We have failed. And just thinking about this, you know, really makes me frustrated because we know how to solve these problems, but we're choosing not to do so. And what's ultimately at stake is our collective human and planetary health and well being. There's really nothing less. So let's get to the solution. How, how can we make this quantum leap in addressing these issues? The roadmap is the green communities criteria. It's the only green building standard designed specifically for affordable housing. And it can be used in any situation for any type of housing, any type of construction, any geography. And we absolutely must transition from gray to green because we just don't have the time or the resources to meet our housing crisis without considering how to meet our climate crisis. And I propose doing both at the same time. Think of it this way. Gray housing connotes practices that benefit a few in the short term, but negatively benefit all of us or the majority of us in our planet. Whereas green housing connotes practices that benefit all of us while supporting the health of our planet now and for generations to come. So an example of how green housing is better and, and more affordable than gray housing is illustrated by Tracy, uh, who I met when she was a nursing student in Austin, Texas, and she had just moved into Guadalupe Saldana development when I met her. And she was, uh, she was quite excited to finally have an apartment that she could afford. And she had moved into this apartment because it was affordable. She didn't know that it also happened to be green. She just knew that she could afford it. And after living in her home for a couple of months, she then began realizing that there were these other benefits. So her utility bills were less than half what they were in her previous gray apartment, which were about $300 a month. And now they were next to zero because her apartment was energy efficient. It relied on solar to generate electricity and heat the water. And where I saw her eyes light up was that her son was sleeping through the night because his asthma was not getting triggered in the home because the home contained healthy materials and had the right type of mechanical ventilation and air circulation. So you might be thinking that this remarkable health outcome is my main point, but it's not actually. The main point I wanna make here is that green is more affordable. Her home was more affordable. That's why she moved there. Most people are looking for housing that they can afford and it shouldn't be up to luck or zip code to determine who gets to enjoy these other co-benefits. And what I also love, and this happens uh, a lot when developers transition to green, is that the neighborhood was improved. You know, I remember when I was there, it, it was a beautiful community and it had previously just been a dumping ground um, in this part of Austin. You know, you could have found batteries there, tires there, just your, you know, sort of dumping ground. Um, but the community had come together and had created a community land trust so that these homes would now always be affordable. And where they didn't develop the housing, they had turned the former dump into a natural green space. And actually part of it was a biofiltration pond and there was a walking path around it so that when you walked outside of Tracy's home, you had access almost immediately to this beautiful green space. And we all know, having lived or really living through COVID, how important those green spaces are to our own mental health and well being. And this example illustrates that when we meet our housing needs with green housing, we do achieve a double bottom line through these co benefits of improved health for people and the planet. I use this example because we often think of green affordable housing, green housing, as an output, a better product but it's actually a better process. It's an integrative and holistic process that extracts less harm and delivers more benefits across the entire process from energy production to materials manufacturing, to transporting materials to the job site, to where those materials end up, and ultimately how the whole process can improve people's lives in the communities and the planet we share. And there are many examples of how our transition from gray to green communities addresses the climate crisis Probably the most talked about example is that by meeting 
the green community's criteria, we know that housing is more energy efficient. I know this uh, because I was part of the team that created the green community's offset fund. And we literally followed what is known as the gold standard. It's used around the world to measure and verify carbon emissions reductions. And we did this with developments that met the green community's criteria. And also quite important is that green communities are, are smartly located. And this results in a significant reduction of emissions associated with less vehicle trips. But in addition, the green communities criteria call for using building materials that do not contain the toxic byproducts and feedstocks of the fossil fuel industry. And this is probably the most under discussed and under acknowledged part of the climate conversation. It's part of the conversation I didn't really know much about until uh, maybe 10 years ago, our production of petrochemicals that gets put into building materials like adhesives, cabinets, carpets, insulation, are not only causing climate change in the production of these products, but the pollution from that manufacturing process doesn't just go automatically up into the atmosphere, it pollutes the air outside and inside, getting into the homes and schools of the people who live nearby so that everybody is worse off. And you may have heard the term embodied carbon, it may sound like a good thing. I thought it was a good thing, kind of like a snow globe, because if it's embodied, it can't pollute, but, uh, but it's not. It's actually a very big problem. Embodied carbon represents the carbon emissions associated with making building products from raw material extraction to manufacturing, transportation, and end of life disposal or recycling. Embodied carbon represents a significant amount of annual global carbon emissions. And yet, there's an incredible opportunity for embodied carbon reduction through material selection, specification, and design. And it just takes a new way of thinking about it, an integrative design approach to make these different choices. So the framework for doing all of this already exists with the green communities criteria. Again, the only standard for green affordable housing. And it's evolved over the last 15 years from when I was working on it in response to new evidence, advancements in technology and input from practitioners and residents. It's evidence-based. So only things included in the criteria are ones known to have positive outcomes, proven methods and materials. We're not experimenting on affordable housing. We're raising the bar so that everybody can benefit. And it does not cost more. And in the handout, you'll see links to cost studies so that you can read for yourself that the green communities criteria do not cost more. Uh, there are at least 120 plus thousand uh, units now of green affordable housing in the country. And I know most of you are in the sort of north Northeast, and there are many examples uh, to show. Also, the criteria have been endorsed by really important stakeholders. So 27 housing finance agencies require that the green community's criteria be met for public financing of affordable housing. And they've, be they've become the basis of Fannie Mae's green financing loans, making Fannie Mae a leader in the multifamily green financing market because they know it's good business and they are not afraid to underwrite the cost savings that result from green construction. Speaking of afraid, you know, I was very uncertain about all of this, particularly about whether green could really be affordable. Um, back in 2004, when I was part of the team um, creating the very first version of the criteria, I remember being told to keep it to a very loose five point checklist. But when I learned talking to developers already delivering green housing affordably was that green was possible and it was healthier and it was better for people and the planet. But even after having a big event in Houston in 2012, where we had gathered hundreds of people to see if we could come together to commit to making all affordable housing green, which we did at that time, I recall the tremendous pressure from the public to instead move on and get back to the business of keeping first cuts and total cost per square foot as low as possible. After all, people just need a roof over their head. But today, I'm not uncertain, and that statement certainly isn't true that people just need a roof over their head. We have more evidence and we have more technical know-how, and it's actually why I decided to finish writing this book that I started in 2012, because it's become imperative that we make this transition from gray to green. 
We have to stop locking people into obsolete housing they cannot afford and that puts them in harm's way while doing nothing to address our climate crisis. Because when we pollute to make our cheap materials, our dirty energy, that pollution affects all of us now and for generations to come. So I'm not uncertain, but it's not about me. It's about what we can do together. And we can use our tools and our influence and our power to make it happen. And it's certainly within our grasp to make it so. So with that, let's go to our second poll as we transition to getting into some of the specifics. Thanks, Dana. And actually, why don't you turn on your webcam, given the presentation type? Um, so the question here is, uh, what comes to mind when you, uh, sorry, I can't see the full poll on my screen here. Um, when you hear great community infrastructure, senior citizens, parking lots, conventional or obsolete. And Michael, I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Dana? Proceed, Michael. Okay. Dana, can you turn your webcam on? You won't see it till after the poll. Okay. Are you able to hear me, John? Loud and clear. Okay. All right, we'll close this up. And as you can see, 28% uh, infrastructure, 21% senior citizens, 18% obsolete, 17% conventional, and 16% parking lot. So quite a distribution on this one. I'm just having a hard time hearing, but um, we will move on here. So um, as most of you saw in those choices, um, you know, really the problem with gray is that it's obsolete. It, uh, it, it's obsolete in the fact that we just, we can't afford it any longer. Um, it's a financial burden for households who can least afford it. I met a woman uh, in Virginia who had this saying that has really stuck with me. She said, you know, we eat cheap during electric bill week. And it's so true for so many who are trapped in this gray housing that uh, they're living in because they, maybe they can pay the rent, but it's just... Uh, it's not adding to the to the rest of their life, and it's uh, certainly not, not affordable to uh, maintain. And you know, we really are generating um, emissions and pollution as we continue to develop in this gray way. And we're putting people in harm's way from the climate impacts on a daily basis. So the number of affordable homes at risk of coastal flooding due to rising sea levels is expected to triple by 2050. And our carbon emissions are not just increasing, as I mentioned, from home energy use. It is this embodied carbon that we spoke about. And embodied carbon will be responsible for almost half of the total new construction emissions between now and 2050. And it's also, this has an impact globally as we continue to see the population growing in urban areas where we are building almost the equivalent of a New York City every month and will continue to do over the next 40 years. So our, you know, we can't afford gray development and our uh, planet and world can't either. The cost of continuing on with our business as usual is unaffordable. So let's go to the third poll here. Great. Dana, can you hear me now? Great, I can. Okay, can you turn on your webcam when we go back on, just because I think folks would like to see you as you're sure. speaking. Excellent. Yep. So the third question here is, what comes to mind when you hear green community? And we have new, sustainable parks, solar energy, Portland, and expensive. Interesting selections here. 
and give folks some chance to respond. And folks are doing so. Again, if you need to exit full screen mode, please do. And again, it'll be interesting, an interesting uh, emergency here that we'll share in a second in terms of the response to this. Okay, great. And the response is here. 35% uh, think solar energy, 30% think sustainable parks, 21% think new, 10% think expensive, and 3% think of the example of Portland. <laughs> great, thank you. So we will keep going here. Um, really, it's it's none of the above. I mean, it's sort of all of the above, yet none of the above, in that it's not one way of thinking. Um, it's a holistic approach to community development from integrative design, location, neighborhood fabric, site improvements, materials, healthy living environment, indoors and outdoors. And what you see here is this great development in Tigard, Oregon, that um, was built to the green community's criteria. And I refer to this uh, development because if you can imagine, you know, this was sort of just a parking lot in a fast growing suburb of Portland. And if you know the acronym NIMBY, not in my backyard, this was sort of your typical situation where the neighborhood just didn't want uh, any affordable housing. Uh, luckily, the community who needed housing prevailed and this development called Olson Woods was constructed. And in so doing, they were able to regenerate this wetland. And this is a photo from you know a few months or so after the development opened, but I went back recently, about two years ago, and it's a flourishing wetland, birds and little critters and foxes. And it's so wonderful because this is family housing to see the children running around and having access to this. And uh, the surrounding community now really uh, loves to have this asset in their backyard and some of the condo developments surrounding Olson Woods use it in their brochures and cite it as amenity. So, you know, the promise of green um, is that we can have housing that really is affordable for all and that makes significant progress towards cleaning our air, again, both inside the home and outside in our communities and across the world. And then this becomes more resilient housing, particularly for the impacts of climate changes. You can imagine if this had remained a parking lot or some sort of asphalt surface, then the heavy rains uh, you know, would have nowhere to go. And as those increase and become more intense, these homes most likely would uh, experience some type of water intrusion into their homes or flooding. So a green community is a process that takes a holistic approach to addressing affordability and climate change and delivering these additional human and planetary health benefits. So we have uh, another poll here. I hope people are not getting too tired of it, but before we t do that, just a reminder that the green community's criteria exist. It's a, it's a way of thinking and that 27 housing finance agencies already require it. There are 127,000 homes uh, or more at this point, and that the savings exceed the cost of integrating the criteria into the housing development, and that we can have measurable and verifiable carbon emissions reductions. So this fourth poll is asking, what are the greatest challenges? If we can have all these things, why aren't we seeing it across the board? What is preventing us from getting uh, all green housing? You should have the poll on your screen right there. I'll give you about 30 seconds more to respond. Thanks, Dana, for sharing that today. Sure. Glad to be able to hear you. And uh... we often run into minor technical difficulties with the technology. It's just, I think, a matter of the virtual world right now. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your patience. And thanks to everyone for participating in these 
polls, since I can't see you, it's my only way to connect. Yes, so we'll leave it open a couple more seconds here and flash the responses. Okay, so in this case, uh, public will 53%, uh, the majority there, 34% uh, said financial capital, 9% technical know-how, 2% green materials, and 1% workforce. Terrific, thanks for that. And everybody's right on this one. Um, it's all of the above. All of those present challenges, not insurmountable ones, but certainly challenges. But also, you know, I guess I'm a, an optimistic person. Um, I see this transition that we need to make from gray to green as being a tremendous opportunity. The fact that we do have a shortage of experienced workers to step into the workforce that we need to both retrofit and build new green housing means that we have tremendous job opportunities. And especially with a favorable administration, you know, I think we can see some federal funds supporting our state and local desire to train more people to be able to not just do the sort of weatherization, but to do this comprehensive retrofit that we need of our existing housing stock while also participating in new construction, you know, and uh, there are very few women actually in the solar industry right now. I think it's three out of 10 jobs are held by women. And, and we need way more people to enter into uh, the solar sector. And so that's a tremendous opportunity for women and others to get in there and uh, learn the skills needed, not just to do the installation, but to maybe own the company or participate in providing the better inputs into the solar um, sector, cleaner, greener materials. And I'll just quickly um, tell this short story about the need for affordable green materials. Living here in New York City, when I first moved here in 2012, I did move into a green building and I was approached by the Environmental Defense Fund to participate in a study. And we were they were trying to figure out uh, what our exposure was as humans uh, in our homes to toxic chemicals. And I figured I live a pretty green life, uh, no problem, you know, let me participate. And I put a bracelet on um, that was developed by, uh, I think, Oregon State University. It was meant to act as a sponge and collect all the chemicals. And I wasn't too worried, but I got my results back and I was horrified. I have 11 bioaccumulative persistent toxic chemicals in my body as a result of where I was living. And, and we often think that, you know, we're not just going to be exposed to things that someone must be looking out for that exposure. But out of the 80,000 plus chemicals that are in use today, you know, less than 300 or so have actually been tested so that we would know if it was harmful or not. And so, you know, we have a long ways to go to have labels on our housing materials like we have on food so that we can make informed choices. And again, this is a tremendous growth opportunity. We need new manufacturing. We need new chemists. We need new ideas and materials. And so I think this is going to be a real opportunity for growth in that sector. Um, and then lastly, you know, obviously, we just we don't have the public will. We, we need to join together and work together to make uh, green housing for everybody. So this is uh, our second to last poll, I believe. Okay, the question here is what do housing and climate justice have in common? And your responses can be nothing, people, buildings, and politicians. Leave this open a little bit more. Again, if you're having trouble responding, you can exit from full screen mode, which some may be using today. You can see the responses coming in. Yeah, I included this question because so often, and I might be giving away the answer, but um, you know, we again we think of these, you know, housing as a commodity, we think of climate justice as an outcome, and we don't think about either as a process and what might be at the center of that process. So I'll stop short of giving away the answer. I'm sure most people will choose it anyway. Okay, I think John will uh, close it now so we can pop this up. 
So this is probably what you're leading to. 79% said people, 10% politicians, 9% buildings, and 2% nothing. Right. Yes, that's exactly what I was alluding to. <laughs> that um, it is people, after all. You know, everyone uh, knows the planet will do its thing and hopefully recover. But it, people, you know, that's what's at the center of these crises of housing, affordability, and climate. And we really need to make sure that everybody has a home that they can afford, regardless of zip code. You know, it just should not come down to the luck of the draw as to who gets to benefit from housing that is green. And uh, we really must use this opportunity of, in the transition to create new job opportunities, to create new wealth communities in the very communities where we are needing to retrofit and build the housing. And these companies need to be owned by the local community and really by the people uh, represented in that community. And so it's a, you know, it's a, it is a tremendous opportunity we, we definitely um, need more materials and we have a job sector that is craving more contractors and more people to help meet the need. You know, this photo is one of my favorites, right smack in the middle, you'll see a white door with a white awning that is 3570 Dudley Avenue in Baltimore. Some of you may be calling in from Baltimore. Um, and this used to be the home of Bernice, who I met when she invited me to come in. And I was struck that the first thing I saw was just a table of trophies. And I asked Bernice, you know, what this was all about. And it was her teenage daughter at the time had just started uh, a very flourishing track career. Um, but Bernice went on to tell me that that wasn't always the case, that her home that she was living in because it was affordable was actually really run down. It was quite gray. Um, and she was able to connect with an entity called the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. And then she was able to retrofit this home that included integrated pest management and included better air filtration, taking out carpet, uh, installing energy efficiency appliances and a host of other things such that now uh, her home is even more affordable. Her utility bill is quite low. And um, her daughter's asthma was mitigated and she took up this track career, which I just learned from Bernice the other week. She is still quite active in running. So, um, I, I, you know, I just, it, it shouldn't be that uh, people have to seek out and look hard and wide for these solutions, we should be making this type of housing av available for everyone. It just cannot be up to the luck of the draw for who benefits. So I promise this is, um, can I promise this is our last slide? I think I can, um, Michael, if you don't mind. Our last poll slide. Okay, and here it is for everybody. What can you do to support a transition from gray to green? And the answers here, learn more about the green criteria, community's criteria, enable it through regulations and policies, incentivize it, and other. And Dana, I'll note that we did get a number of comments about other possible categories for some of the other questions. Oh, um, great. We may talk through some of those during the Q&A. Uh, great. Because obviously, you're making some points here as well, but I think the others have some observations based on that, which I'm sure will lead to some discussion. So leave it up for a couple more seconds uh, for the see the distribution of responses on this one. And thanks again for everybody participating in all these polls. It's good good information um, to have at the end. So here for this one, as you can see, 43% uh, enable it regulations and policies, 27% learn more about the green community's criteria, 24% incentivize it, and 6% other. Great, thank you, Michael. And I, yeah, I look forward to seeing what some of these comments are. Um, and everybody's right on this one too. You know, it, it's all hands on deck sort of situation. Let me just advance um, to our last slide, just to say that we all, you know, need to do everything each of us can from the positions that we're working from. We need a national commitment to transition from gray to green. Um, 
I have some ideas you'll see in the book for how to go about this. But at the end of the day, you know, really, it's up to us to join together and to advance this from where we sit so that we really can make this leap from gray to green and avert or at least diminish these dual crises of climate change and housing affordability in one fell swoop from gray to green because you know we just really have to stop locking people into obsolete housing that extracts from our collective health and well-being because when we pollute to make our cheap housing, our cheap materials, our dirty energy, it's impacting all of us. That pollution affects all of us and, and we can do so much better. So let's join forces. I'm really interested to see what questions um, have popped up along the way and to get into conversation with each of you. So thank you. Thanks, Dana. Um, so we have, I think, available in the chat, or, or there was a handout available there. You can also go to um, the Smart Growth website page, uh, where we have the uh, materials from today's uh, presentation are available for download. And we are recording this, and we'll also be posting it um, in a couple of days uh, as well. So appreciate everybody here. So we were inundated by questions because we have a very large audience today. So I'm gonna just uh, start with some and we'll just go forward to about 2.30. And you, if you haven't already submitted one, you can use the questions tab and they, that all comes up to us here to review and share with Dana. So uh, first one, I guess, is from Martha Curran who says, uh, she has a comment and a question here. So when HUD funded and financed new affordable housing, is often being built by private developers who are looking to make a profit and where HUD funds are only part of their overall financing, how can we make the case that they won't compromise their profit by adopting the green community's criteria? Must it be done by changing regulations to require the adoption of the green community's criteria or can the profit case be made on its own? Yeah, that's a great question um, and a fundamental one. And we have seen, though, that HUD, through its various programs, even if it's a small portion of the budget, when they have required that the green community's criteria um, be met, then the whole development has to be met. So when we're working with developers who need public subsidy to keep the cost affordable, ultimately, for the rent price or, or the mortgage, then we do have a lot more leverage. And um, you know, we still need to make sure all of those levers are incentivizing the green community's criteria to be met. But maybe where this question was going, Michael, was also, you know, if I'm uh, maybe I don't need the subsidy um, and I'm just delivering housing, how do we, how do we make that uh, sort of argument to someone who's just making a profit? And it, it is a lot harder, but you know, I do think that there have been success stories where developers understand ultimately that what they're doing is having an impact on the planet in terms of either the carbon emissions or the, the waste and the pollution. And they begin to realize that they can actually save money. So this is where the for-profit developer um, gets drawn into the conversation that they can save a lot of money by adopting this way of thinking. When you meet green building standards early on, when you commit to doing that early on, you begin to save costs. Um, and we see that time and time again. It's also one of the reasons why the US Green Building Council's rating system called Leadership in Environmental Energy Design took off because it just made sort of financial sense for developers and owners of fairly expensive real estate. So. I think how we make the argument to the for-profit developer who may not need the subsidy is uh, to bring them into the conversation by saying they can actually save money and that they have a responsibility. They're part of, uh, they need to be part of the solution. Okay, thanks Dana. Um, another question here, which we've got many. Um, could you please elaborate more about how a successful case for green housing came about? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, really, it came about, if you think back to sort of 2003, I had actually just left Maryland Department of Planning. I had 
gone over to the enterprise community partners to engage in large-scale community planning work. And uh, we were beginning to see that in the private sector, the U.S. Green Building Council's lead rating system was beginning to take off. And what we were hearing from people like Greg Katz and others was that there were all these benefits of building green. And those benefits, those health, those economic, those environmental benefits, we knew would be most beneficial to people who had the least resources to access that. And so we began wondering, can we bring the benefits of green building into the affordable housing sector in a way that wouldn't add costs, wouldn't diminish from how much housing we need to develop, but would actually make it better and that we would realize these other benefits. And so that's that's the origin story was we were seeing benefits happen for the commercial private developer of class A real estate. And we wanted those benefits for affordable housing, as I mentioned, you know, uh, the, the operating costs are lower, the um, overall development costs can be lower, and these additional co-benefits, kind of the bottom, the double bottom line, are that people are better off as we're also then reducing carbon emissions, which we absolutely need to, especially in this day and age. Okay, thanks, Dana. Um, just looking through a few of these to figure out which one to ask you next. Um, okay, next one here is, our community's housing advocates are busily turning our green to gray. How is it environmentally beneficial to downzone established residential neighborhoods full of old large large old trees, grass, and gardens, and replacing them with high density, large structures and large areas of impervious land whenever the magic word of affordable is used. And Michael, if I'm understanding, the question is in that person's particular community, they're seeing the reverse happen where they're using green spaces and turning it into high density development. I would say they're going from Yes, green to gray for sure. And and so that's where we have to look at how are they allowed to do that? What what are what do we have in place locally that is allowing them not to think about because density in a, in and of itself is not bad. It's just, you know, when it's done in a way where you're not thinking about having access to green space, having access to other ways of getting around in the world where you're you know, sort of just building and cramming in as much as possible. Density can be done, and some of the images I showed you were actually quite high density, but they were done in a, in a better way. And so I, I think in those situations, if we're seeing um, communities, you know, sort of, it sounded like just barreling over green spaces and cramming in as much housing as possible, then we need to think about you know, what's allowing that to happen, what kind of conversations might we get started with those community groups? Why, why are they advocating for that kind of development? Um, what else might we be able to achieve together? So it's probably not a very satisfying answer, but um, a lot of this does engage, you know, involve engaging with the community, having difficult and, and sometimes fraught conversations, and then also looking at uh, what's on the books to allow that to happen and to reconsider and put different uh, scenarios in place. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dana. Uh, next question here is from Annie Dixon, who's asking, is there a tool that helps provide estimated savings by doing green building instead of gray that developers can use before they even break ground on a project? Mm, I wish there was that we need that kind of tool. Um, not that I know of, unfortunately, not something quite as simple as that. There are plenty of case studies, so a developer could access, uh, and in your handout, you have a link to the Green Communities web Resources website, and there are case studies. Um, and so I guess it's not a very satisfying answer, but you would, you would have to sort of look at comparable developments and see how were they able to do it affordably. Maybe there's a calculator in the works, um, but not one that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, there should question. be. I hope that yeah. person creates one. <laughs> it's, an, it's an interesting project to take on for sure. Um, next question is, how do you see capital flowing into the transition to green affordable housing 
do you think that green bonds can be a solution? Yeah, I do actually. You know, I, I think I'm from the train of thought where capital is by itself is not the problem. It's how do we make it do what we want it to do. And I really do appreciate this sort of flourishing now of some of these green banks and green bonds and green financing vehicles. Um, they, they can be tremendously useful. What we have to make sure happens though is that there, there are these requirements that those bonds are um, tied to sensible programs that require real affordability. So oftentimes some of the green financing vehicles um, are trying to maybe go into the niche market um, and don't actually just readily solve for providing the financing subsidy that's really needed to get these developments off the ground and to keep them affordable and deeply affordable. But I, yes, we, we do, I think, need all of the sort of capital products that we can think of to come to bear on this. And, and hopefully at some point in time, you know, I would like to see the sort of um, chart where all of our financing products are heading in this direction. And, and maybe ultimately then they're not called green bonds, but you know, they're just bonds to get us in uh, to developing in the way that we need to. Okay, thank you. There's another one with a comment and a question from Molly Robinson who says, um, I'm glad to hear about the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. It's important to note that we cannot just rely on new development to move from gray to green. And if we do, the obsolete housing just gets thrown away with, with its embodied energy. Historic tax credits are another program for some older housing to be renovated with green materials and systems. It's a question. So what policies and other incentives are there for homeowners and perhaps more importantly, landlords to renovate with green building technologies and who is leading in this space? Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I, the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative certainly um, is part of the solution there. I would highly recommend there over all over the country i think in over 25 cities at this place um, there's also an effort i talk about a little bit called energy efficiency for all that's the name of the website i believe it's in the handout too um, and so you know i think the question then becomes where are the incentives for the landlords and you know this is part of the work ahead for all of us is to write these into the new incentives that will be coming down the pike, particularly with the new administration. I certainly have my eyes set on this commitment that's been made called Justice 40, that all new investments into clean energy and climate change are, are to benefit low-income communities and underserved communities. So we have to make sure that, that those efforts um, bend the arc towards getting those incentives to landlords who are trying to do the right thing and want to make that transition and keep their rents affordable. Okay, thanks Dana. So another question from Chris Whitenhill who says, um, can you elaborate more on how development costs and material costs are lower with green construction? I'd like to know how to make this argument financially given the increased materials cost. Yeah, um, so there, I would cite two resources also in the handout, I believe uh, the first one is already there, the Healthy Building Materials uh, Network and Healthy Building Network is the name of it. Um, and also there's um, an, another effort called, um, well, anyway, I'll have to follow up with this person individually, but um, the the question is how do we make the case for these green materials? And um, it's sort of a dual-edged sword, I guess that's why I'm hedging a little bit, is that um, we still need more affordable products, but there's tools like Pharos, which is P-H-A-R-O-S, um, if you go to Healthy Buildings Network, where you can access and see, you know, what are you already, what, what were you going to specify in the first place? 
and then to see the comparable or a healthier alternative. And what we are finding is that there is often not a cost increase to that, um, certainly not for basic things like better cabinets and flooring and paints and um, insulation. So that's the reference I would use. They have some great case studies on their website and they're very approachable. If you wanted to contact them, um, they would be amenable to that and to provide you additional resources. But the reason I said I'm hedging a little bit is we're not quite there yet. As I mentioned, that is part of the challenge is that we need these greener materials and we need them to be affordable. So in my seat at JPB, we've actually started something called the Healthy Affordable Materials Project. It's run out of Parsons New School for Design, but it includes uh, other partners, the Healthy Building Network being one of them, Health Product Declaration Collaborative being yet another, and then the Green Science Policy Institute, because we have to make more progress in this space, but it shouldn't prevent us now. And, and uh, there are certainly affordable products available and uh, HBN is a good place to start. If you are in the affordable housing market, then HPN is, uh, is another place to go and I'll have to send that afterwards to you. Okay, and we have the email address for you, Dana. We can share that. And right. as well, if they want to email you directly, your contact information's on the screen right there. Yeah. Um, Next question is from Katia, who's asking, what role could the legal community play in helping to develop green communities? Ooh, I've never been asked that question. Um, what role could the legal community play? Um, so that's a good question. You know, I think helping us to show a lot of times the, one of the challenges to making the transition is that we feel there's some amount of risk from going from something that we know so well to something that we don't know so well. And that's where I think the legal community oftentimes can be helpful in showing that there isn't going to be uh, this sort of legal risk for, for heading in that direction. Um, it's a challenge that we haven't quite overcome, to be frank, uh, as we've been trying to measure some of the health benefits of using mechanical ventilation, this issue came up over and over again, that owners of affordable housing didn't want to engage because they were afraid then that their practices prior that were gray, that they would be held accountable for them. I'm not sure if um, this resonates with the person answering the question, but that's one of the challenges I've come up against where I thought, wow, it would be terrific, you know, to have the legal community behind us helping us sort of understand. Um, and, you know, I think also just being outspoken and uh, we need all professional sectors to come forward and show how their sector can help address both the housing affordability and climate crisis. So I would be eager to know how you think uh, they could contribute. Okay. Well, well, obviously you, they can connect with you as well. And if they have another follow-up, we can, we can continue that conversation here. But in the meantime, I guess the next question here, another one with a bit of a comment in, embedded with it, is uh, what about the advantages of older building stock in green communities? While many old buildings do have energy deficiencies due to poor upkeep or the lack of updated HVAC systems, they can, which research has shown, be updated at a low cost risk. There are, these opportunities also come with many tax benefits for the occupants. By reusing and recycling older housing stock, we eliminate the need for new highly processed materials as well as materials that end up in the landfill. Does this fit within the retrofitting that you've discussed and can you expand on any incentives that we have for working with retrofitting? Yes, I love that. And it's actually one of the uh, examples I provide in the book early on where I went uh, just outside of Chicago to talk with a developer who had uh, a historic structure on his hands and he was trying to renovate it and, and make it green. Um, and he was able to, and there were tremendous cost savings. And it, uh, yes, the embodied energy of the, for this building, the bricks, you know, um, was tremendous. It, 
there's always constraints. You know, you have for him, it was uh, not being able to replace the windows and uh, a few other things. So there, there are some constraints, but we absolutely um, need to engage these beautiful structures that have historic significance and make sure that they're also prepared for the impacts of climate change and will stand the test of time. And you know, there are many ways to retrofit them and to bring them up to a green building standard. The green communities criteria certainly apply to historic structures as well. Um, I'm not so up to date actually on the incentives. So um, I, yeah, unfortunately I don't know what specific incentives exist um, for the historic structures themselves. Okay. And I think we have other resources and programs where we talked about this in the past. So uh, you may want to look at the archives, not you, Dana, but the folks in the audience. Um, Next question here is from James Schultz, who's asking, is there a tool to measure a degree of green similar to a walkability index for a neighborhood or address? <laughs> I love it? these tools that we need to develop that are getting referenced. Um, you know, there's, there's not actually a, um, a tool where you could, what I think I heard them say asking is, you know, could they type in an address and see how green it is? Now we've been working on that and others have been quite successful in specific communities. Um, I'm thinking of like Atlanta, Georgia, where there was a lot of work done by the real estate community to build that in. And I believe that has expanded to other communities. So I would urge them maybe to check in with their local real estate um, association to see uh, because that I think is a great solution is that if we attach how green the building is, or the property or the home is to the, to the lease um, or to the history of that home through the mortgage, then, then it becomes something that we can actually look for and ask for. And we're not quite there yet. And that's where collectively, even in our own personal lives, if we're thinking of renting a new apartment or purchasing a new home, we need to be asking these questions. How green is it? What standard was it built to? What standard was it retrofitted to? What is my utility bill going to be? How healthy are these materials? Because we're not we're not there yet. Um, I know in, in this pandemic, I, I've been looking at homes myself, you know, just to get outside of the city, and that information isn't always readily available. Some communities have done a better job, and it's really been led by their realtors. Okay. Thanks, Dana. Um, next question is, how could state coastal managers working in climate hazard resilience planning? I'm not resolution? hearing anything, Michael, if you're speaking. Oh. Okay. Well, there may be a little bit of a lag. Can you hear me now? Yes? No? Anything? I think the audience can hear me, but I'm not sure if you're having an audio issue on your end. Any luck? No? <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Um, I'll just uh, rem remind people while we wait for the audio to catch up that uh, I did send out the link to the um, website archive page. John, I'm not able to hear anything. Okay. I can hear you, Dana. Um, let's just, we'll just pause for a second um, while we're here. Um, so I did save the uh, or share the link to where we have the handouts today and that's the same page that we'll have the um, recording pa uh, pasted once that's been processed later on. So Dana, can you hear me yet? No? I think we're, I think the audio is working here because I'm getting the indication that it is so. Can you hear me, Michael? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to, can I po post a, uh, paste a question in for you to ask her? John? I can hear now. You can. Okay, great. I think there might have been a lag. Are you still can hear me? I can, Michael. Okay. All right. Um, so the next question here is, sorry, we're just a little bit lost in this because of the technical issue. Um, Hold on a second.
here's a, I guess a general question is how can we push our local planning boards to support green infrastructure? Yeah, we we need it. Uh, we need them on board. Um, I think it comes both in knowing who is getting appointed or elected to those positions, make sure that we're asking these questions before they take those seats. And then when they have taken those seats, I, you know, I, th I think the more we can experience things um, and realize that it's possible and that it's better and people want this. Um, so, you know, I always, it sounds corny, but I, there's nothing better than like a, a site visit, right? Like a tour of green infrastructure, being able to touch something and um, understand how it works, realize that it will also have these economic benefits because you, you will need people to maintain that infrastructure and that could be hired locally. So there's always the economic development upside um, and probably lower maintenance costs too. You know, I think that it just, it all, for me, the, the one of the first things I always try is to get people to experience the green infrastructure, take them out um, and have them talk to people who interact with it. Or, and if, the, if it isn't in their community already, you know, going to uh, another community that they respect or that feels similar uh, is always a good solution. Okay, thanks Dana. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, excellent. Next question is, from Megan Houston, who's asking, what's the first step a local government should take to promote green affordable housing when the market is already overwhelmed with regulations and rising costs? Yeah, I would say reach out to the green community's staff at Enterprise and they can come and sit down uh, with your community and explain, you know, that this would not add costs, that actually there can be savings, not only for the developer, but um, you know, it, it, it's just better for the community because of these co-benefits, sort of the double bottom line of having the health benefits too. So with the reduction in these real health issues around asthma and less exposure to toxic chemicals or just um, other health issues, it has a, has a real impact then for that community. And so I think it's sort of helping them to see how it enhances the overall community and that it will keep that housing more affordable longer and help that city commit, if they haven't already, but hopefully they have, to any climate action goals that they've made and pretty soon probably will have to make. Um, so I think it's again, you know, showing some of the studies that it doesn't add cost, uh, helping them understand where it's been done successfully, and that the community itself will have these co-benefits. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Christopher Keller, who's asking, are you aware of any affordable green communities that have been developed without subsidies? Oh, um, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to name one because so much of my past was involved in properties that use the low income housing tax credit. And uh, so I'm so sorry, nothing is coming to mind. I, um, I'm happy though, if they wanna reach out directly, I will send them some names, but it's certainly possible. Um, and I do know that they exist. I just am not thinking of what they're, where they are and uh, their names. Okay, thanks, Dana. And there's always interest in in digging down into the specifics on these uh, webinars. So um, yeah, and no, that's a great question, and you know, it sort of speaks um, to maybe what I was trying to allude to about where we need to go in terms of a just future. Is that um, you know, it would be great to get to a place where we're just making sure that everyone has access to housing that they can afford. And right now, the fact that that can only be done through subsidy um, is troubling. But, you know, if depending on the developer, then it just depends what kind of capital they have access to and uh, what price points they're needing to rent or sell those homes at. But again, it just goes into that need to sort of step back 
on the front end and design the property in a way where um, you're going to be able to do it if you're trying to do it without a subsidy. And it is possible. It does take a lot of uh, forethought, though, but it is possible. And in fact, um, just as we're talking about this, a couple examples have been sent in from okay. the audience here, including Babcock, Ra Babcock Ranch in Southwest Florida, Earthship Biotexture, uh, which has a website that we could send out and a project in Atlanta, I think called Seren Bay or something similar. I'm not familiar with that project, so I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. So apparently right. there are some, and I'm not surprised um, given the focus that we yeah. have on. And I would urge people too, in the handout, there's a link to uh, Community Solutions. Uh, uh, some of that, um, some of the developments I'm aware of that didn't access subsidy necessarily were part of community land trusts. And that, so that whole network of community land trusts is also a great place uh, to go to and see how they're able to build green housing without using subsidy because the land has been put into trust. Okay. So apparently for the Babcock Ranch uh, project, babcockranch.com is a website that folks can look at for more information about that project. So thanks Great, to everybody. I'll look it for up. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. You know, that's the advantage of doing a live uh, webinar is we can have a little bit of uh, dialogue here. Fortunately, in the webcast mode, we can't unmute our participants, but thanks for everybody sending those in. Um, next question is from Sylvia Silverman, who's asking, would public-private partnerships be helpful in promoting green housing and increasing equity? Oh, for sure. That's the best way to get it done, really. Um, both the private, I'm not sure quite maybe what that person is referencing, what part of the private sector and what part of the public sector, but, um, you know, that really is necessary. We, we've been talking about this a little bit already around the notion of subsidy and how do you get your community to require this. And it, it takes, you know, having the conversation most often, you know, with the private sector development community and uh, the public sector kind of regulatory and, and financing community um, and to get those sectors together and to really think about how how they could be mutually beneficial but yeah overall i know this is a very general answer so i apologize but um the overwhelming answer is yes i mean they're incredibly beneficial we absolutely need public and private partnerships on this mm -hmm. especially because you know when when the public sector uh, you know moves in this direction there are private sector benefits like i said you know if if we are requiring green housing, then there, there's a whole market, you know, that needs to be tapped into and um, from the private side around delivering healthy, green, affordable materials or these contracting jobs and, and companies that need to get formed. So um, not only is the relationship itself necessary to come to an agreement about how we want to be developing and uh, together, but sometimes when the public sector makes a move in this direction to transition, it opens up possibilities for the private sector to step into. We've already heard a couple tools that need to get developed, you know, that would help probably accelerate this transition. And that's, you know, I think if the public sector makes it clear, this is where we're heading. Oftentimes then the private sector can step in with that level of certainty and meet some of the challenges that we may be facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some, certainly a lot of complexity in, in dealing with this as an implementation process. Um, again, going back to the, I guess, the idea of tools and, and ways of scoring this uh, question from Jake, Jason Hercules is, wouldn't green rating systems and certifications serve as those green scores that buyers and renters could, would want to be informed of in their decision making? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Was it Jason? Thanks. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that is... Yes, that would be a place to start, you know, ask, did this property or did this home, did, does this apartment meet any, and I list them all uh, in my book, of the existing green building standards. You know, the Green Communities Criteria is the only one specific for affordable housing, but 
there's the lead rating system. There uh, are a host of uh, others now. And so that's a, yeah, that's a great start. Ask, you know, what standard does this property meet? And that also helps generate a conversation that, that we need to have some rigor. You know, we want to know what does it mean to be called a green building? And so that's the advantage of having a property get certified to meeting one of these standards that the buyer or the renter, the owner then knows what they're getting and what they should be expecting in terms of performance. So it's a great, it's a great place to start, Jason. Yes, thank you for that. Okay, thanks. And there really are some good ideas that people are sharing. So we'll share all of the the thoughts and comments with Dana to look at, and we may be able to pull some of them out and add them to the webinar archive page as links. I think Great. there's a lot of interest in this area, uh, given the number of folks we had on today. Um, next question here is from Dave Monk, who's asking, in addition to the potential cost savings from green building practices, are you seeing any emerging examples of broader community economic benefits by reducing energy burdens that helps to stabilize at-risk populations, which in many cases may be essential workers for their communities. Yeah, for sure. If I'm understanding the question right, you know, what are the other benefits for the community? Is that what it was asking, Michael? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, even you know, some of the brief examples I cited. If you go back to sort of Olson Woods, right? The notion that um, if you're thinking beyond the perimeter just of the footprint of the building and you are thinking about how to improve the overall neighborhood fabric and uh, add to the, the existing community, that's where then you can restore wetlands, you can allow green spaces to kind of go back to their natural spaces, and all of that has a benefit. So, for sure, it has sort of this health benefit of us being able to enjoy those spaces and what that does um, to our mental health and well-being. But now that we know, you know, the impacts of climate change are already here and are only going to exacerbate if we don't intervene, those amenities then reduce the urban heat island effect. And in many communities where there just isn't access to nature, as we saw as we lived through uh, last year, summer around COVID, um, you know, some people just can't afford to condition the air in their homes and it gets quite hot. Now, if there had been some green infrastructure, if there was more access to natural spaces, more trees, uh, then we can actually reduce the heat um, that does accumulate because of those asphalt and paved surfaces. So that's, that's the one that comes ready to mind just because we were already sort of talking about it. But um, part of being, a, you know, meeting the green communities criteria does involve this notion of thinking about how any new development in particular strengthens the overall fabric of the community so that we're not just, as I think someone alluded to, in communities that are going from green to gray, you know, we're not just plopping down housing without thinking about the health and well-being of that existing community. And as I started off acknowledging the land that I'm standing on, also the historical context and the culture of the community. And so it's not enough, you know, just to have a kind of a green shell or, you know, a green building. It absolutely adds benefits if we think about it and intentionally integrate that way of thinking to extend those benefits beyond just the four walls of a home or some type of green structure. Great, thanks, Dana. So we're getting close to 2.30, so I'm just gonna ask you a couple more and then we'll wrap up today. And again, thanks for everybody who submitted questions. We've gotten many, many here and also many comments, so appreciate the, the input I'm here I'm not as hearing well. you, Michael. Oh, sorry about that. John, do you wanna to try to, to see if she can hear you? Can you hear me now, Dana? I can, thank you. Okay, so um, can you hear me now, Dana? Sorry about yes. that. Yes. Okay, so I think I'm just gonna ask you one more question and given the time and then ask you to wrap. But um, again, thanks everybody for being here today. And I guess this is a comment that maybe you can respond to is another challenge is that architecture and engineering firms that have a track record of design, build housing and affordable housing do not have green design 
materials and business models and profit strategies uh, that fall in this realm. And so they shy away from green projects be because uh, design and construction work that incorporates new strategies slow the process and are risky to those firms. Is there some way to kind of work with that situation and help? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I and I appreciate that question because I, I've seen it in action that happens quite often when maybe someone, uh, the owner or the you know leader of the development wants to head in a certain direction and is committed to transitioning from gray to green. But if the the rest of the team and the subs, you know, everyone else involved don't quite get it, um, oftentimes then it does compromise the integrity of that vision. And so it's incredibly important. Um, and so, you know, it, it will come off cliche to say, you know, you really need to hire the professionals uh, on your team or as contractors to your team that do understand it and are committed because there's a growing number of, you know, many firms and, and individuals who understand how to design and engineer this way. And so, it, you know, if you're able to, that needs to be part of your search process and who you're using and who you're allowing to work on your team. And if, if it's a case where you just can't change, um, then I would take advantage of any host of sort of training opportunities and expose them, maybe even create a situation where they can talk and meet with another engineering firm for whom this is kind of business as usual or meet with an architectural firm whose name is associated with you know, great green affordable housing um, and start there to, to learn if you aren't willing to part ways with those contractors. Sometimes though, at the end of the day, uh, it does take parting ways, but I know the best place to start is through education and exposure to a different way and to stand firm, you know, that this should not increase costs. There's no reason to, and um, to make sure that that's part of those contracts. And again, maybe that's where the legal community can help. Yes. Now, there, there were some thoughts also suggested about ways that the legal community can participate in this area as well. So we'll, we'll try to figure out a way to share that information. I guess one last question before we wrap. Uh, and this one's from Meredith Baldwin, who's asking, the approach that you're suggesting seems very applicable, applicable to suburban areas or less dense urban areas does or how does it apply to already developed and dense urban communities oh definitely it already does apply it's probably where you see more of this happening actually um so in all of the major cities you know the san francisco was actually the first city the uh, current governor was then the mayor so gavin newsom uh reached out almost immediately when we launched the Green Communities Initiative and said he wanted to participate. And so, you know, a place like San Francisco already requires this kind of development. A lot of the major cities, sort of dense urban areas are among those that already require this, um, maybe because they can, you know, because uh, of the need to develop and of the constraints that exist, um, they can put requirements on sort of the public subsidy that may be required but we it's actually more it's easier i would say to do in cities partly because of the question that the last person asked that is also sometimes where you have more access to the firms the engineer firms the architecture firms the design firms who are already doing uh, green because you also then have commercial properties that have for decades now also been meeting the us Green Building Council's leadership in energy and environmental design rating system. So you have that exchange of the knowledge base in cities. And uh, so there are plenty of examples of where that's happening. Great, thank you. So I know we've covered a lot of ground today and I appreciate everybody's interest uh, in this topic. Obviously it's very strong. Um, so I just, in closing, Dana, wondering what you might want us to take away from our conversation today and keep top of mind as we return to our day jobs and, and begin a lot of us working in this area. Yeah, first of all, just you know, tremendous gratitude for everyone joining and um, for some of the technical difficulties to, for sticking it out. And you know, I hope everyone walks away with the sense that 
this is possible. And even more so, a sense of this is the direction we need to go to collectively come together to make this quantum leap, as I call it, to addressing both our housing affordability and our climate crises. And we really can't afford not to at this point. And it is possible, we know how, and if we join forces and do this together, we'll get there faster and better. So I would just urge us to lean into one another and to step forward and work on making this quantum leap together. Great, well, thank you, Dana. Thanks for your time today. And thanks for sharing your wisdom. Thank you, Michael, it's a great pleasure. Great. Well, this will conclude our webinar, Great Green Communities Addressing Affordable Housing and Sustainability. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Dana Borland for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru, who helps to make everything happen, as you saw today. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those of you who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation please look for this follow-up email. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. Keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars, including three upcoming programs that we've already scheduled, including Replenish, Supporting the Virtuous Cycle of Water and Prosperity with Sandra Postel on Tuesday, March 30th,